Professor Dr. Kathan Mehta, my very good friend from MPH and now a hemato-oncologist. He has an extensive background in clinical and academic medicine. He did his medical school from BJ Medical College, Ahmedabad, that did his MPH from Drexel University. We were in the same batch for MPH. And then after that, he did his residency and fellowship from UPMC Pittsburgh. And right now he is in attending and he has won so many awards that if I start talking about it, we won't have time left. So without any further ado, over to you, Dr. Mehta, to share your story and your pearls about MPH Research EB1. Uh, hello, good afternoon. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes, Katan. Uh, well, I'm, I'm Dr. Katan Mehta. So I'm originally from India and I went to BJ Medical College. I graduated back in 2011. It was a very confusing at the time uh, to decide what to do next because there are a variety of ways you can enter US, get into residency and then establish career and decide about what, to, what you want to do for, for your future. So at the time, what I decided is that I would do the MPH because I was graduating in June in my own university and most of the time, the NPH or any master's programs in US starts in September. So it worked out well in the sense that between June and September, I would have some time to prepare for USMLE, give my step one, and then join any program like a master's program in public health uh, in anywhere in US. Uh, but it required some planning at the time because any program in US, whether it's a MPH or others, often require you to give exams like GRE, TOEFL, and those all can take some time, uh, at least two or three months to be done. And deadlines to apply for the program is also at least three to four months in advance. So that's why if, if someone is looking to join any master's program in US, it still requires at least nine to 12, nine to 10, 10 months of planning to for before anybody can really apply or join the program. So if you're, if somebody's looking to join the program in September, then they would have to give the GRE and TOEFL before December, the year prior, because most universities will have their application deadlines somewhere in December. So you would have want to have your applications prepared and then send it to the universities where you're applying by December, even if you are going to join next September. So that does take some planning, but once, once you do that and you're done with your application, after December, it gives uh, uh, at least eight months of time for you to prepare for your USMLE and give at least step one. And that's what I did. So I gave my GRE and TOEFL exams before December of the year before I was graduating. And after I did that, I submitted my applications and prepared for step one for about seven months and gave the step one in, about, in August before I was coming to US. Now, I think when I look back, things have changed. Uh, when I applied, step one used to have a score and Step one scores were very useful and were very competitive to get into the appropriate programs. But if I believe correctly, uh, now the step one is pass or fail. So that may have changed. But in any case, step one is still important uh, if you're planning for coming to US. So the, when you are in the medical school, in the internship, planning ahead, if you're looking to go into a program with like MPH, would be very important because not only that you'll be doing your internship, you'll also be taking exams like GRE and TOEFL in addition to preparing for your USMLE. So that's why planning ahead becomes very key if you are going to do something extra that's not necessarily required. Now, going forward, if I share my story that I completed my step one before I came to US and joined the MPH program at Drexel University in Philadelphia. So I gave step one in India when I was there. Then I came to US in September 
of that year and joined the MPH program at Drexel University. And subsequently, I think my educational curriculum was very extensive. It, I learned a lot because most of the physicians from countries like India go to medical school directly from the high school. So there is no bachelor's degree involved in the middle. So my major in, in the MPH was biostatistics and that also led to me learning a lot of programming. And the programming mostly involved writing codes to analyze very large data sets. And that skill was not widely available in the medical field, especially in somebody who has background in medicine. So for example, you can have physicians who are expert in the field, but they may not have any knowledge of statistics or programming. Same way, on the other side, you can have experts in statistics and programming, but they may not have any knowledge in medicine. So in that sense, doing MPH with a major in statistics gave me a very unique characteristics and abilities where I had a background in medicine, I'm a physician, and then I also learned a lot about how to write programs and how to analyze large data sets. So that's a, a, a unique skill and abilities that I developed during my master's program. Now, going back in time, not only that during my master's program, I was learning the skills and applying it, but I was also preparing for other tests. So at that time, we used to have a step two uh, CS, which was clinical skills, which I don't believe exists right now. But I still had to prepare for step two CK, which was clinical knowledge. And then I gave, it, gave the exam during the, end, during, the, during the first year of my master's program. And by the next August or September, when the application cycles were coming, I was ready to submit my application. And because I had background in data science and statistics, I was also able to publish a few papers and abstracts before my applications were submitted. So that helped me to distinguish myself from other candidates who were applying for residencies at several institutions. So I think that's the story where, how I got into residency, but the benefits of MPH does not end with getting into residency. And what that means is that not only that after I got into residency, my skills that I learned while doing the MPH continue to stay with me. And that made me a very valuable resident for all the faculties, not only in my internal medicine program, but also in other subspeciality programs like cardiology, gastroenterology, hematology, oncology because there were not that many people who had skills to analyze large data sets. And that made me a go-to person for a lot of faculties in the entire division at University of Pittsburgh. Eventually, after doing research in different medical specialities, I decided to go ahead with hematology oncology as my career choice and a fellowship. But having MPH and having background in, in research and data analytics helped a lot to actually get into a very competitive programs and then eventually doing hematology oncology fellowship at University of Pittsburgh. And the benefit of MPH and learning that you get with MPH does not end with the training. And that is also true. That is true more for physicians who are coming from India, who are looking to get visa and eventually get into green card and residency. 
and, and the citizenship. For most Federations who are not from India and other foreign countries, it usually does not take too long to get the green card and the Nigancho citizenship. But unfortunately for Federations who come from India, it does take a long time to actually get the green card. And the range could be somewhere between 10 to 15 years after you graduate from residency. And then four more years to become a citizen unless you are able to get the green card in a different categories. And to elaborate more on that, the green card has primarily categories which are classified as employment-based category one and two. On a common trend, all physicians who are going to be working in US on a visa will qualify for employment-based category two green cards regardless of their citizenship. But unfortunately, if somebody is an Indian citizen, then in the second priority EB green card, it takes 10 to 15 years for, before you get the green card in the hand. However, if you have background in research and you are able to show to the USCIS, which is the agency that adjudicates all the green card petitions that your work is in the national interest and you are valuable to the country, then you can apply for a green card in a different category called EB1. And that makes a very significant difference in the time frame that you get the green card. Instead of waiting for 10 to 15 years, you could potentially get the green card in one year. And then subsequently, you can apply for citizenship after five years. And again, all of this is only important to physicians who are coming from India, because physicians from India do face 10 to 15 years of time frame before they can get the green card and then even choose citizenship. If you are from country other than India, such as Nepal, Pakistan, or others, then it's not something that would matter to you because you should be able to get the green card within six to 12 months after you are done with your residency or physician jobs. Now, going forward, while NPS did contribute to me getting the green card and the eventual US citizenship, the MPH also stays with you for the rest of your career. So for example, because I have the MPH, now when I'm attending, I'm also able to get a directorship position where I'm able to direct the division, manage the budget of the division, and also direct hiring, recruitment process, and so forth. So having a degree such as MPH, or MPH, MBA, in addition to your background in medicine and being a physician, also will help to guide your career for the rest of your life. So it's not all about getting into residency. It's also about guiding your career and also rest of your life by having additional skills that you would not have learned during your medical school. So, so that is where I am. And what I would say at the end is that getting into a program like MPH is very valuable, not only to get into residency, but also eventually to get green card, become a US citizen and advance your career, not only in medicine, but also in administrative roles in different hospital systems. Thank you, Dr. Mehta. That was a wonderful presentation. Before we move ahead, can you shed some light on the EB1 criteria and like what criteria did you satisfy with your profile? Yeah, so e EB1 has uh, seven different criteria. Now, each applicant is 
required to satisfy at least three out of seven. Now I'm just going over the list of the ones that I was able to satisfy is that, uh, so I was a member of uh, Alpha Omega Alpha. So that satisfied a criteria of being a membership in association in the field, which demand outstanding achievements. Then I had published several articles that satisfied a criteria for evidence of published material about you in professional journals. Some of my research was also cited in major news articles. So that satisfied another criteria that evidence of published material about my research in a major media. And there were two more criteria where evidence of original scientific and scholarly publications that I met, and then evidence of authorship of articles in the professional and trade publications that I met. So I did meet four to five criteria out of those seven, mostly by doing research. But then there is also a second layer of that criteria where it says that even if you meet three or four of the seven criteria, that doesn't mean that your application will be approved. There is a second layer of the process where it's up to the adjudicating officer, where the officer has the ability to determine that whether all the, all the evidence presented constitute an extraordinary ability or not. So most of the time, the officer looks at the citations. So what that means is that if you publish 10 papers or 20 papers or, or 30 papers. But even if you publish, if your papers are not cited by other researchers, then the value of your publications is not that well. So that's what the adjudicating officers look at. That if you publish 30 papers, that's great. But how many of the other researchers cited those 30 papers in their own research? So if you publish 30 papers, and then if you have 600 citations, which is on an average 20 citations per paper, then that would make it a good application to state that your contribution was valuable to science. On the other hand, if you have 30 papers, but if you only have 60 citations, then what that means is that it's on an average two citations per paper, and in that sense, your contributions to science are not that valuable because your colleagues are not citing your paper. And that's what the adjudicating officers look at when they try to determine the value of your contribution to science. So it's not specifically stated in the criteria that are published by USCIS, but it is very commonly used by the adjudicating officer to look at how valuable your contributions are to the science. Thank you, Dr. Mehta. So the second question would be then, how do we become uh, members of Alpha Omega Alpha or organizations like that? What is the criteria and what is the procedure? So in Alpha Omega Alpha is a society uh, and there are also others such as Sigma Psi is an under society. So all these societies are governed internally and all of them require a sponsor that would make you an applicant within the society. And each society has criteria that they evaluate the applicant and then decide whether to accept or not accept the applicant. So. So each society has different criteria. So it's hard to really say what would be the general situation which would allow somebody to become the member. But the common theme is that you would have to have a sponsor who is part of the society. And that is often a challenge that you could be a great researcher, but if you don't have a sponsor who is part of that society, then you may not get it. Thank you. And then in terms of citations, like how do you, how do we increase the citations? Like what are some methods that can be used to make sure that your paper is at least read by lots of people? So citation increases. Well, sharing your paper in social media like Facebook, Twitter, 
uh, can be a common example of how you can increase your citations. But beyond that, it's mostly about sharing your papers in the regional conferences and national conferences. That a lot of times the paper publication and the conference presentations can go hand in hand. And a lot of journals are willing to coincide your presentation in the conference with the publication date to coincide both of them, then that leads to a lot of visibility of your research and publications. So that's the most common way for researchers to make other colleagues aware of their publication findings and new knowledge. Thank you for that insightful answer. I also heard of something called a search engine optimization on Google, where if someone searches the term, a specific term, then your papers might be coming higher up in the search results. Do you know anything about that? I'm personally not familiar with that. Uh, I've heard of it, but I never used it. So I don't have too much insight into how that process works. Got it. And then if someone is doing basic sciences research, that is normally not cited as highly as clinical research. So is that taken into account when the USCIS officer uh, evaluates your application? That, you know, along with the USCIS application and your citation report, you're also supposed to provide recommendation later letters from the experts in the field who you have worked with. And you're also supposed to provide letters from experts in the field who you have never worked with. So the people you have never worked with can essentially be a judge of your research and publications and provide attestation to USAS officer and how valuable that they think is your contribution. Got it. So those letters of recommendations can also substantiate your application. But the key is that anyone who is providing that kind of letter should not be affiliated with you in any way. What that means is that they cannot be from your current institution. They usually cannot be with, from an institution where you have worked in the past and they have never been a co-author of your papers. So if you're able to find experts like that who have never worked with you, who have never collaborated with you, but they are still able to write a letter of recommendation to support your application stating that your contributions to science are very important, then those are also some of the valuable factors that the USCS officer will take into account. Got it. So if you were to go back in time and take the decision all over again, would you do MPH or not? And what would yeah, you do yeah. differently? If you would do it, would you do something differently? Then how you approached it? I don't think so. I would do the MPH all over again and I would still pick statistics in my, as my major. So I think I'm very satisfied with my choice and I'm also very satisfied with my choice of major because when you are doing MPH, uh, you, you, you have choice of different majors like epidemiology, statistics, environmental health, community health and prevention. And then you're also supposed to choose one of them and I'm extremely satisfied for me to have chosen statistics as my major. That's very insightful. So tell us more about like why statistics and why not say epidemiology or why not environmental or why not other specialties? How does just doing statistics help you more? So I think it goes uh, into our background as physicians. So we are already trained in diagnosing and treating health problems. While we go through our training, we also go through some training in environmental hazards, risk factors, preventing and, preventing and social medicine, etc. that would already make you somewhat trained in that particular discipline. In addition to that, we also get training in epidemiology during our medical schools for the most part, for some, at least in the preliminary way. And then Community health and prevention is also uh, one of the part that you learn as your medical school. But at least for me, what I feel is that master's level statistics is usually not taught 
in medical any medical school that I am aware of. And if you are a master's level student in statistics, in addition to being a physician, then that adds to your resume, that adds to your skills, and that will also stay with you for the rest of your life. Very true. But say if someone doesn't have the money, say MPH is costly in lots of places, and someone is getting, say, a research, a research associate or research assistant position at Mayo Clinic or Harvard or any of the top institutes, how would you help them decide what to choose? And then if you are advising MPH for someone, how should they think about arranging the finances if money is a problem? Well, I think that's a difficult question because everybody is in a diff different financial situation. But you're right that doing MPH does require money and it does have significant tuition depending upon which university you choose. But what I would advise is that even if you are going to choose a university that is not very expensive, you can still expect to get very good training if you choose statistics as your major. And you will learn a lot, even if you choose another school which has lesser tuition. So I did my MPH at Drexel, which is a private university. And when I entered Drexel, I was able to get a Dean's Fellowship, which reduced my tuition by 50%. Now the Dean's Fellowship and other scholarships at each university has certain criteria that they look at, but all those criteria are different for all the universities. So you have to look into individual universities criteria to be able to find out whether you will fit or not and apply to that particular program and see whether you are able to get the fellowship or the scholarship to reduce your tuition. So I was lucky enough to get the Dean's Fellowship to reduce the tuition by 50%, but I do foresee that if without that fellowship, I would have been had very difficult time to really complete the program at Drexel. However, I do know that other people and friends have done the programs at other universities, like University of Texas and others, which could be cheaper than Drexel, for example. And even in those universities, you can still get great quality of education, uh, and then you can still learn a lot and that will stay with you for the rest of your life. But getting the fellowships or the scholarships are very key and getting high scores in GRE and TOEFL is also very key to get into those scholarships and fellowships. That's very insightful, thank you. And then comparing the fees of a state university to a private university, how much is the difference? Like for example, comparing your fees after the 50% discount to University of Texas Houston, what were, what were the fees? Like, what is the rough estimate of how much money should one like expect to pay during this period? If I remember correctly from my time frame in Drexel, the tuition itself, tuition itself was somewhere between thirty and forty thousand dollars after the fellowship. So, if it was, if I did not get the fellowship, then it would have been total sixty thousand dollars, seventy thousand dollars, but because I was able to get the 50% fellowship that got reduced to somewhere between 30 and $40,000 total. Uh, when I speak with other friends uh, uh, who did the master's programs in other parts of US, like University of Texas, it corresponds to be about the same money uh, because those universities are a little bit more conservative in giving fellowships or scholarships. So uh, approximately, Thirty to forty thousand dollars of tuition, and then there's additional cost of living in the U.S. and also surviving in the U.S. for the two years time frame. And then, of course, you will have to pay for your U.S. MLE fees, and if you are doing rotations and going anywhere else uh, in in your during your coursework to get clinical experience, and that all will add up to the cost. Thank you. So, so to go, go on a tangent, like lots of people are question are sending me questions saying that how did you manage to study for your steps along with doing all this work, along with doing research? What was your typical schedule of the day? I think the key was that I finished my step one before I started the MPH. 
So I finished my step one before my MPS started. And then after I entered US, my first goal was to finish the step two CS, which none of you probably will have to worry about. So that took about four months. And then after, after December of that year, for about eight months, I prepared for step to CK while I'm, I was doing MPH, studying MPH, and then also trying to do as much research as I can. Uh, and also try to do on-campus jobs because all of us, uh, if you are coming from a foreign country, then you still need economic resources to survive in US. So I was also doing on-campus jobs like teaching undergraduate students, being a teaching assistant for the course. So it, it does take a lot of hard work to be able to coordinate all that. So doing MPH, preparing for USMLE, giving USMLE, and also doing on-campus jobs like being teaching assistant, it all takes a lot of work. So it, it's very important to be very organized and also be hardworking. And I think that's the key. That's very true. So to add to that, I remember you had very high scores. So if my memory serves me right, you were somewhere on the range of 257, 258, something at that time, which is almost equivalent to a 275 right now. So if, for example, your scores were really low, so you were in the 210s or 215s or 205s, and you had the MPH, would the MPH still have a reasonable impact? Or because of your scores, the impact would have been sort of nullified? Well, that's a, that's a difficult question because all programs screen applications differently because all programs receive thousands of applications every year and they can't accommodate to interview everybody. And obviously they will screen the applications based on certain criteria. So I'm, I'm not entirely sure if having an MPH would help you get through the filter because the filter will still go through certain criteria such as what's the step one score, but now it's pass and fail, but still step two scores and step three scores will, could still be there. And then if it's filtered out, then it's still filtered out. But MPH can certainly help you develop connections. So for example, when I was doing MPH with a major in statistics, I had personal connection at 12 different institutes. And what that means is I was personally connected with researchers at 12 different institutions who I would have never worked with if I did not have the MPH. Because a lot of the research that you do is based on large data sets that you can do from your home computer you do not have to be at the physical location. So if you're based in Philadelphia, you can do research with somebody who is based in Texas, for example. The same way when I was doing that, I was connected with researchers at 12 different institutions and I got interview at all 12 of them because I had personal connection with all those 12 interviews. That's very true. I think making connections is an integral part of MPH. So I think the main takeaway point I'm getting from all this is in MPH, you need to do the work to make the connections. You need to do the work to do research. Just an MPH itself without doing any of these things is not very helpful. Yeah, I think that's a very right way to put it. That MPH as a degree just attached to you won't help much. But if you work during your MPH and learned a lot during your MPH, did the research and made connections using your skills, then that can transform your life. Very true. So then another question that uh, folks are asking is what exactly is OPT? What exactly is an OPT extension? What is the difference between a one-year MPH and a two-year MPH? And how should one go about thinking about it? Well, I think one-year MPH are only available at very few institutions like uh, Harvard, Hopkins. And those are more geared towards late stage professionals. So if you are uh, someone who is a medical professional coming to US with an eventual goal to get into residency, then one year MPH is practically not ideal. Because when you are in a one year MPH program, you'll be extremely busy in your program itself that you will have zero time to your USMLE. Now it's different for somebody who has already completed step three. So if you are someone who has already completed step three, and then if you're looking to join a program that is one year, then that would certainly fit 
with your goals and where you are in your career. But if you are still giving the step one or if you just finished the step one, then it is impractical to go into one year MPH program. Because until you finish your MPH program, you will have zero time to work on any of your steps. That's However, whatever. Yeah, sorry, go on. Yeah, so, but once you're done with the MPH, you know, there is an OPT period, which is optional practical training. And that is usually awarded to everybody for one year. And that's what I use when I went from MPH to residency. So before I entered the residency, I did not give my step three. I only had my step to CK cleared. And when I entered the residency, I entered on the OPT. And I gave my step three during the first year of residency. And then I switched from OPT to H1B starting the second year of my residency. So having that one extra year definitely helps if you have not already completed your step three because without step three, you're not eligible to get the H1B even if your program is willing to sponsor. Now, I know that there is now a STEM extension that is about for two years that did not exist when I graduated. But theoretically, it may be possible that you can do your entire residency on an OPT, which is the one year of OPT and two year extension. But again, I'm not personally familiar with that concept and it did not exist when I graduated. Very true. I think that is possible. I think um, I don't know anyone who has done it beyond one year, but I mean, as long as the program is okay with it and the OPT extension people do classify the residency as a public health extension, then that is very possible. But I personally don't know anyone who has used it to like complete their entire residency just on OPT. And just to clarify, OPT means you don't need any visa. You just can use the OPT and uh, basically do it without any visa. You don't need J1, you don't need H1, you are able to stay in the country. So now that brings me to another question. Say if someone uses an OPT, they are still struggling to get residency, they use the extension, five years have passed, low scores, bad profile, haven't matched. Now they want to maintain their status in the country. So after the OPT extension ends, does that mean that they have to go back to their home country to do a waiver or they can still stay on and do other things? Uh, uh, can you ask the question again because you asked about the OPT extension and the waiver because the waiver would not apply if they have not been to J1. Yeah, so OPT, they did three years, okay? And they <laughs> now want to maintain status. They, are, they don't have a visa. Research people are not giving them visa. They haven't matched into a residency. Does that mean they have to go back to the country at the end of five years or they have options to stay in the country? Uh, well, I, I'm not again familiar with that situation, but I can imagine that if they've already used the total three years of the OPT and that's and then they don't have additional job that would sponsor H1 or, or other visa, then they would probably have to go back to the home country unless they're able to get into some other program like another master's program, for example, an MBA or some others which will change their status back to F1. Yeah, that's, that's very true. I think the so one additional fact I think that I remember is that you can get F1 for, for other things as well. Like, for example, for GMAT preparation, if you take a Kaplan course, you can get an F1 for that. If you take a step three course through Kaplan, that also qualifies you for F1. So that can help you maintain your status in the country at that time. Um, another question is, how much is the difference in learning between one and two years of MPH? I think one year programs are very rigorous and they're only available in certain elite institutions like Harvard and Hopkins. Uh, so I'm not personally familiar with what would be the difference in the learning if you were to go to Harvard or Hopkins versus Drexel, but I can imagine that uh, one year program will take a lot uh, of your effort to learn the same things that you can learn in two years. So it, it really personal how much you can learn in, in a in short time frame and how much, you, how much time you have to actually learn all those things that they are looking to teach you. But if you go into one year program, be prepared to be very hardworking because none of those programs are easy to excel. You could potentially fail those programs and never get the degree if you go into those one-year programs and then not prepare to work hard. Very true, very true. They are pretty intensive. Um, the other question was that how do we decide which programs to apply? Is there a place where we can look at all programs? 
And is there like an application portal like ERAS? The, the common application portal is called SOFAS, S-O-P-H-A-S. So that's the application portal that all School of Public Health uses. And there are at least 30 to 40 School of Public Health that would participate in that particular portal. Uh, and that probably should be where most physicians who are looking for MPH program will start because there are very rare number of programs like Hopkins that may not participate in SOFAS, but otherwise all major programs of School of Public Health will participate in SOFAS. Thank you. And then is there any way to get loan in the United States for these things? Generally, you would need a co-signer uh, who is a US citizen or a US green card holder. So you can get private loans. You will never be eligible to get a federal loan if you're not a US citizen. Mm -hmm. But if you're able to get a co-signer who is a US citizen or a green card holder, then you may be able to get a private loan. Okay, and what would be the interest rate in that private loan compared to Indian banks? If someone wants to take like say Indian loan and someone has a green card person who's willing to sign, what would be the rough difference? Well, generally the loans in US are have much better interest rate than loans in India. So that's a general trend, but it, it changes from time to time. And then the the conversion factor between dollar, US dollar and Indian rupee also keeps on changing from time to time. So if you do have a co-signer in US, it is always advantageous to get the loan in US than getting a, a loan in India or, or other country for that matter. Got it. And, and what, at, at what point do you apply for the loan? Like once you get acceptance or once you're already in US? No, you, most of the time, once initially when you apply to the university, they will send you a letter of acceptance. But once they send you the letter of accept, acceptance, they will send you a list of requirements that you will have to give it, send it back to them. And that requires uh, some sort of bank balance or a letter from the bank that says that they have approved your loan, etc. And once you have submitted those documents to the university, that's when they issue the final letter of acceptance, what they call I-120. So you will not get your I-120 unless you submit those documents of financial ability to sponsor the education. So mm -hmm. most of the time, if you are not in US, you will have to secure those funds without applying a US loan. So what that means is that you would have to apply to a loan in, in, in a foreign country like India or use your family funds to provide documents that there is enough funding available to complete your education. And that's what will eventually lead for the university to issue the I-120. But once you are in US, you can apply for a loan and then get that loan once somebody is willing to co-signing a loan. So that's the approach that most people use, that initially when you're trying to get admission, you will still have to somehow figure out the finances in your home country. But once you enter US, you can still find out somebody who is willing to sponsor your loan. Great, thank you very much for that. Uh, how do you make connections at MPA? Like how do you approach folks? Like do you email, do you talk to them? Where do you meet them? I think it's important not to be shy. Because most of the time when you're coming for the first time in the US from a foreign country, you might end up being shy. And that may not end up being in your favor. So I think it's important to talk to people, email people as much as you can, ask for appointments mm -hmm. and see what you learn in those appointments. Because even if the appointment fails uh, with a faculty, it's not going to hurt you because all you are losing is just that they won't give you any reference or letters or they may not give you work or they may not lead to for you to get any particular benefit when it comes to residency application. But I think emailing the faculties, asking for appointments would probably be the key so that you can start developing connections sooner. Thank you. And what exactly should the content of the email be? Like, say, for example, when you come out directly from medical school, you don't have a profile. Most of them don't have publications. So without all that, how do you push to get a position with them or to work with them? I think most of it will uh, have to be related to their own research. 
that you can email them that you are interested in this research topic giving a very brief description of the research you don't want to say that you know too much about it because you won't and then share that you would like to volunteer working with them and that would be the easiest way to connect with them thank you thank you that was very really useful if someone has not been matching for a lot of years and now they want to do mph and like to build up their research profile to build connections and money is not a problem do you think that that would be useful? Say someone has a YOG of 2006, not matching in six years, has scores in 210s, 220s, don't have a green card. At that time, do you think just learning research and publishing stuff would be okay? Or does MPH add even that those research publications? And you would advise someone like that to go for MPH? Oh, well, MPH without learning the skill has no meaning. So if you are joining MPH, you have to have a goal of what you're going to learn, whether it's an epidemiology or statistics or something else. If your goal is to just get the degree behind your MBBS degree or MD, then that won't help. So if, you, if you're joining MPH, your goal should be that you want to learn either epidemiology or statistics or whatever that that interests you. And then if we do learn more skills, then that will guide and help you in your next endeavors. But MPH alone, just as a degree without learning any new skills has no value. Very true, very true. Um, so to add to that, anything else you would like to advise folks who want to go for MPH? So I think uh, it, it's, it's worth the effort and the money because it's going to stay with you for the rest of your life. Not just when you're applying for residency or fellowship or looking for green card. It will also stay with you when you are in attending. Mm -hmm. It will also stay with you when you're, when you're trying to ascend and get promotions from being an attending to an administrator or get higher positions within the hospital systems. So it's going to stay with you for the rest of your life. And the skills that you will learn will also stay with you for the rest of your life. So true. it's worth the time and the effort and the money on the long run. Very true. We have a couple more questions. So after MPH, say, for example, you don't get a job. I'm oh, sorry, you don't get a residency. So they want to know what are the prospects of coming out with an MPH in like, say, epidemiology or biostatistics? What kinds of jobs you can do? What would be the paycheck? Can you get an H1B on that? Uh, what I can tell you is that, yes, there are lots of, lots of jobs. I personally know people who did MPH, did not go for residency after MPH, and they have a decent paying job. Now, when I say decent paying job, it's not like a physician attending, but it's still a decent paying job on an American standard where you can live a very comfortable life save enough money for retirement and raise a family. So you can definitely get that even if you do not get into residency. Now, whether if you do the major in epidemiology or biostatistics, then you must make sure with your school that that's how they're classifying your major. And if that's what it is, then you should be able to get total three years of property without needing any visa. So, and there are also jobs that will sponsor H1B while you're doing that. But then if you have three years of OPT, then you at least have three cycles of H1B to get a sponsor, apply for the H1B and get lottery, get into lottery and get the H1B stamped. And I do know that jobs exist that will sponsor H1B for MPH graduates with different skills. But the skills are key. You have to have the skills. If you don't have the skills or you don't learn new skills, there won't be any jobs. True, true. That's that's very, very important because it's like if if you're not learning anything in MPH, you're not going to get a job without the skills that you need. So so piggybacking on that, if someone is applying to MPH to just become an MPH expert or become a biostats expert or become an epidemiology expert. Do you think that at that stage, going to Hopkins and Harvard for a one-year sort of program instead of doing the 
full two year thing would that be more beneficial if they are not even thinking about residency absolutely so if your goal is to actually be a public health professional or be a statistician or be an epidemiologist and then excel in that field then yes absolutely because uh, harvard and hopkins are top top institutions in the whole country and if you have a degree from those institutions then that will stay with the rest of your life and you will always be called a harvard graduate or a hopkins graduate so that is absolutely true so if your eventual goal is to stay in the public health field then if you have a degree from harvard or hopkins then yes you should go ahead and do that true and the last two questions we are running out of time but one question is geographical location if someone's end goal is residency and they want to go to an mph program is the geography of the place important like for example should they try to find mph programs in say nyc philadelphia baltimore places where there are programs that take imgs versus say doing a program in say texas or mississippi or somewhere where there are not too many imgs would that make a massive difference i'm not sure but if i have to guess then i think yes that if you are located somewhere in northeast region then a lot of times programs may end up sending more interviews but again i'm not sure about that okay thank you very much and the last and final question this is a personal question by a student so mevesh shiddiq is asking i live in chicago no visa needed goal is residency which university or school would you advise me for mph if money is not a concern i would say drexel i am very happy with drexel and mm-hmm. i think i did well so i would say apply to drexel okay mm-hmm.